numbers dropping as well. And after the rain band that we get sweeping through on Wednesday, the rest of the week will bring sunshine and some showers. Ben. Darren, thank you very much indeed. And that is it from the BBC News at six. Now it's time for a look at the news where you are. But from me and the team, good night. Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. The moment armed police confront a man accused of planning to detonate a homemade bomb in a terror attack at a Leeds hospital. It's not bomb inside it, but it's not live. What is it? What's it made from? Pressure. A pressure cooker. And what's in it? It's not live. Gunpowder. There's gunpowder in a pressure cooker. We'll have the very latest from Mohammed Rafouk's trial. Also tonight. Her father is jailed for 10 years after his son is killed while the pair walked across the M62. The head teacher resorting to skydiving to beat a shortage of school funds. And I'm live at rehearsals with the most successful brass band in British history. Join us all later in the programme. And this picture just about sums today's weather up. Kirk Burton near Huddersfield, a lovely rainbow. It has been quite a showery day. Don't forget to join me for that week ahead forecast. Hello, good evening. It's nice to be back with you tonight. A patient at St James's Hospital in Leeds has been describing how he talked a would-be bomber out of detonating a bomb at the hospital in January this year. Nathan Newby was giving evidence in the trial of Mohammed Farouk, who denies preparing acts of terrorism. Today, police released footage which shows the moment armed officers confronted Farouk and realised he was carrying the bomb. Cathy Killick reports from Sheffield Crown Court. The court has already heard that Nathan Newby's actions may have saved many lives. On that night in January, he noticed a man who seemed upset waiting outside St James's Hospital. Thinking he may have had some bad news, he decided to ask him if he was all right, and he started chatting to cheer him up. As the conversation went on, Mohammed Farouk told Mr Newby he'd worked at the hospital for two years but had lost everything and been stabbed in the back and he wanted to get them back. Farouk kept looking at a bag beside him, and when Nathan Newby asked him what it was, he said, it's just a bomb, and showed him as if he was talking about a pair of trainers. He said he planned to detonate it in the hospital canteen. Eventually, Farouk gave Mr Newby his phone and asked him to call 999, saying he'd changed his mind. Mr Newby dialed, all the time feeling the phone could be the detonator, Farouk also handed over what looked like a handgun and asked Mr Newby if he could shake his hand. When the attending officers arrived, their body camera footage was also shown in court. Anything else we need to know about? To keep everyone, to keep myself and my colleagues, everything else safe. OK. Is it, there's a bug there. It's got a bomb and what, in it. What's in it? There's a bomb inside. There's a bomb inside. Well, it's, it's not live. live. It's not what? It's, it's not a bomb live. inside it, but it's not live. What is it? What's it made from? Pressure cooker. A pressure cooker, and what's in it? It's not live. Gunpowder. There's yeah. gunpowder in a pressure cooker. So it's pressure cooker with gunpowder inside it. What? It's a pressure cooker that's filled with gunpowder, apparently. Mohammed Farouk admits possessing a pressure cooker bomb with intent to endanger life, but he denies preparing acts of terrorism. The trial continues. Cathy Killick, BBC Look North, Sheffield Crown Court. Next night, a father from Leeds has been jailed for 10 years for the manslaughter of his 12-year-old son who was hit by a, a car as the pair tried to cross the M62. Matthew Rycroft had been drinking before he crashed his car on the motorway. His son Callum was then hit and killed by another vehicle. Corin Wheatley joins me now with some more details. Just remind us what happened that night, Corin. Yes, Amy, this happened on Saturday the 5th of August this year. Matthew Rycroft, who's 36, had been drinking during the day. He'd been to see his parents in Huddersfield with his son Callum. Now, Matthew Rycroft's dad had urged him not to drive home and his parents also rang him to tell him to pull over. And it was during that conversation that Callum could be heard in the background saying, Dad won't stop. Uh, now, Rycroft was seen driving erratically. At about half past nine at night, he swerved across 
lanes on the M62 and hit a crash barrier. He managed to get off the motorway to the services but flipped the car on the slip road. Now we know that Callum, who was 12, called his mum and 999 but his dad told him to end the call. A short while later, the pair were seen crossing the motorway to the central reservation and then for some unknown reason, they crossed back again. Now, Rycroft got to the hard shoulder and carried on walking without looking back but Callum was hit and killed by another vehicle. Um, now, Rycroft was found later hiding in the bushes by the fire service. He didn't ask where his son was or mention him. Um, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter at an earlier hearing in September, and today he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The judge told him that he'd abandoned his son. Such a tragic case is this, and, and Callan's mum did make a statement, didn't she? What did she say? Yeah, Claire Bancroft said in her victim impact statement, Callum was with someone who he trusted the most, someone who should have kept him safe and brought him home. She also talked about the special bond that she had with Callum, who was born with spina bifida and had autism. Talking about Matthew Rycroft, Callum's dad, she said he's torn the family apart, he's hurt a lot of people, but mostly he's let Callum down, all because of his selfishness. She said Callum had had a bright future ahead of him, that he loved life and that he was loved by everyone. So very sad. Corinne, thank you. Some of the day's other news now and a rucksack filled with weapons has been shown to a jury at the inquest into the death of Chesterfield woman Gracie Spinks. The brown backpack, which contained knives, an axe, Viagra tablets and a handwritten note saying do not lie was discovered by a member of the public on a farm track in May 2021, six weeks before Gracie Spinks was stabbed to death in Duck Mountain by Michael Sellers while she was tending to her horse. The inquest continues. Protests have been taking place today at some Asda supermarkets in Leeds, York and Sheffield over what the GMB union calls unequal pay. What do we want? Equal pay! When do we want it? Now! The union says there's too much of a gap between the earnings of the distribution centre staff, who are mainly men, and the retail workers, who are mainly women. But Asda says those two sectors are very different with their own skill sets and rates of pay. Absolutely demoralised. They are key earners for families, particularly in the cost of living crisis that we're in. You know, these families are making decisions. Do I put the eating on? Do I feed the kids? What do I do? It's Christmas. You're being paid nothing compared to the men. About 100 people turned out today for the funeral of a Normandy veteran from Sheffield. Cyril Elliott died last month aged 103. He was called up to fight during the Second World War back in 1942 and took part in the Normandy landings. Cadets stood alongside veterans and invited guests at Shire Green Cemetery this afternoon to remember Cyril. It's very heartwarming, isn't it, to see all these people and, and the respect that they have for Cyril. What do you think he'd make to to this, so many people turning out for him today. I know exactly what he'd say to say, do all these people know me? I don't know them. <laughs> because he, and he'd be humbled, he'd be saying, why, why, why have they come for me? That's, that's what he'd be saying, because he, he was just, uh, so, uh, just an so, so almost unassuming that he would be, uh, oh, I don't know, he'd be overwhelmed by it, I'm sure. You're watching Monday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. Entire hockey family will dearly miss Adam and we will never, ever forget him. A vigil in Sheffield in tribute to ice hockey player Adam Johnson. Next tonight, the family of a teenage girl from York who died of a rare blood disorder are now helping other families to cope with long stays in hospital. Millie Wright died in 2021, aged just 13. Now her mum and dad have launched a charity in her name to support families who have children with life-threatening conditions. I went to see what they do. It's Saturday night. These volunteers have given up their evening to help feed parents at Leeds Children's Hospital. First job is to stock six ward kitchens that parents have access to, including intensive care. What we do is we're providing items for parents to help themselves to so food here is available to them 24 hours a day. A pizza delivery arrives. There's enough for 24 families to enjoy supper at their child's bedside, like here on Unit 50 for children with liver conditions. 
Surya and Nigel Wright spent six months in this hospital with their daughter Millie. Saturday supper is their idea. When you're in hospital looking after a seriously ill child, you don't think about your own needs first, you think about the needs of the child. It was when I was asked to give 60% of my liver in order to save Millie's life that I realised I hadn't received a meal in the seven weeks that I'd been in hospital. Hi, Laura. Oh, hi. Laura is hundreds of miles away from her home in Scotland. Her newborn baby, Myla, needs a liver transplant. They've been here almost three months. Millie Wright Children's Charity hasn't just provided pizza, but grants to help with the costs of being away from home. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been hard. If I've had hard days, we have to get through it for her. And what kind of difference does this sort of support well, make? Well, honestly, um, they fill the kitchen on a Saturday as well. And the pizza, it just brings a wee enjoyment to your Saturday. Like, we get to watch Strictly Come Dancing and we eat a little bit, bit of pizza, <laughs> don't we? But yeah, we can't thank them enough, can we? I like making stuff. We was playing with foam today. With foam on that sounds yeah. fun. In the room next door, 10-year-old Stella is also awaiting a liver transplant. She's been here seven weeks. The pizza is an extra special treat for little brother Elijah, who's visiting from their home in Bolton. Good, because I get to share with my family. Yeah, and do you like pizza? Yeah. Saria and Nigel know what these families are going through. They're hoping to open up more support in other children's hospitals across the country, one pizza slice at a time. At the moment, um, we would like to have a model that we can scale and use in other hospitals as well. So that's addressing food needs, it's addressing play needs, it's, it's addressing a whole host of needs that, that fall to the charitable sector to fulfil. Millie Wright Children's Charity, they do an absolutely fantastic job and it was a joy to spend the evening with them. Right, let's get some sports news now. Sally is here with the latest. Sally, all yours. Thanks, Amy. Yes, we start with Sheffield Steelers because the ice hockey team say they've never needed their fans more than this coming weekend when they'll play their first matches since the death of an opposition player last week. Adam Johnson died after an injury to his neck from a skate during a match at Sheffield Arena. Steelers coach Aaron Fox says it's been difficult and emotional for his team to get back onto the ice. And this weekend, fans gathered for a vigil. On Saturday night, a week on from the death of Adam Johnson, fans came together outside Sheffield Arena to remember him. Adam, Nottingham Panthers number 47, was an outstanding ice hockey player, a great teammate and an incredible person with his whole life ahead of him. Adam Johnson, who played for the Nottingham Panthers, died from a neck injury during a Steelers game. There were 8,000 people inside the arena who saw what happened, many of them traumatised. Speaking to people, people just want to come together and to show us respects. Um, it's a good way that people can chat and it's the first step, coming back to the arena and speaking to people. Some days I just sort of disbelieve that anything's actually happened and it must have just been some bizarre dream. Um, and then other days it's really difficult, but it's, you just take it as it is. Everyone's been brilliant at reaching out, so. We're there, front row. Uh, with my five-year-old granddaughter so uh, yeah it was traumatic um, you relive it over and over in your mind you know we we're just all shocked overnight the Steelers have confirmed they will resume games at the weekend with head coach Aaron Fox sending his condolences to the Johnson family and friends he said it's been very difficult and emotional getting back onto the ice for the guys but I feel like it's been an important step and our players have shown some real strength and courage during the last few days being back inside the arena. That first home game will be on Sunday. The club says it has never needed its supporters more. A really big turnout showing the strength of feeling there. Football now and Bradford have announced the appointment of their new manager, Graham Alexander. Alexander previously took Fleetwood from League Two to League One via the playoffs in 2015. Most recently, he managed MK Dons, but was sacked by them last month after just 16 games in charge. On to the weekend's action now, and Sheffield United got their first Premier League win of the season with a 2-1 victory over Wolves. It was a stoppage time penalty fired home by Oliver Norwood that gave Blades the win in front of a home crowd at Bramall Lane. It's a special place on a game day, Bramall Lane. It's something that, that I'll always cherish. So, yeah, this will be another one of those occasions where I know when I watch those moments back and you're watching the, the video back, I'll, I'll be enjoying the boys' celebrations and the fans' celebrations. 
in the FA Cup. Chesterfield knocked out League One leaders Portsmouth yesterday in one of the shock results of the first round. Tom Naylor headed in the Spyrites goal to win the game 1-0. It was Portsmouth's first defeat in any competition since March. A really impressive win for Chesterfield. This, who are two divisions below them, they'll play Leighton Orient in the second round. Everyone was to a man fantastic. Before the game, it was just a challenge. It was like we're playing League One opposition and we're flying. Go out there, how good can you be today? How, how well can you play? How can you bring your game to affect it? And to be fair to, to a man, everybody did, didn't they? So we need to keep, take that form into the league and into the next round. Harrogate are also through to the second round after their 5-0 win against Marine. But Bradford Whitby and Worksop were knocked out. And first round replays await for Barnsley, York, Doncaster and Scarborough, who all drew their games. Now to Rugby League and England's men's, women's and wheelchair teams were in action in Leeds this weekend. It was a clean sweep for the men against Tonga, winning all three of their games in the series. And Harry Newman, who also plays for Leeds Rhinos, made a great start to his England career, including making this catch to score a try, helping the team to a 26.4 victory. And it was a decisive victory for England's women. 60 points to nil over Wales. Amy Hardcastle on her home ground at Headingley scored the first two tries of the game and was named player of the match. But England's wheelchair team facing France at the Leeds Arena just left themselves too much to do after a lacklustre first half, losing to their World Cup rivals by 34 points to 43. And that's your sport for now. Thank you very much. Now, a head teacher from a school in Home Firth who says funding shortages are impacting education has taken an unusual approach in raising money. Reverend Evelyn Barrow has raised thousands of pounds to help pay for equipment by doing a skydive. There she goes. Gosh, rather her than me. But whilst her bravery and can do attitude has provided a great lesson for her students, she says funding does need to change. Beth Parsons has the story. <laughs> Little bit nervous, got a few butterflies. Reverend Evelyn Barrow, the head teacher at Newmill Infant and Junior School in Home Firth, says schools are facing rising costs and there's no endless pot of money. So she's taking an unusual approach to tackle some of the shortfall. She's preparing for somewhat of a long fall. I can't wait, I'm about to throw myself out of a plane to raise money for New Mill Schools. 15,000 feet, and she's aiming to raise a fiver for every foot of that, hopefully making £3,000 for the school. I'm sure I can find a million daft and bonkers things to do to raise money, but really, we're supposed to have a free education system at point of, of sale, as it were, and that doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. The amount of money coming in doesn't match the amount you need to provide that world-class education that we as a country want except it didn't quite go according to plan. Bad weather has meant Evelyn's had to cancel four times. But finally, under clear and sunny November skies, the time came. I am a little anxious about it, but feel the fear and do it anyway. That's what they say, isn't it? Undoubtedly an unforgettable experience. But what Evelyn also can't forget is how much of a short-term fix this kind of fundraising is. We're having to fund more and more from parents, from, from fundraising, etc. We really do need to come together as politicians and as professionals and find a better way of making our system work and funding our system so that it is that world-class education that we want. The Department for Education said school funding will be at its highest level in history. Thousands of schools are receiving significant additional funding this year and next. For now, though, thanks to one head teacher, another £3,000 is ready to be spent in a West Yorkshire classroom. Thank you to you all for your support, encouragement and donations. You are amazing! Beth Parsons, BBC Look North. Wow, that certainly is going beyond the call of duty, isn't it? Well done, miss. Now, you may remember 10-year-old fundraiser Luke Mortimer, who last week told us all about his upcoming climb up MC Crag in North Yorkshire. Well, over the weekend, we are thrilled to say that Luke conquered the crag and uh, in the process, he raised over £13,000 for children in need. Look at him go, fantastic. Throughout the two-mile trek, Luke, who in 2019 had to have both his arms and legs amputated after contracting meningitis, was joined by his family and over 40 hikers all there to cheer him on right to the summit. 
when we were right at the top, there was like a really steep, rocky, kind of scrambly bit. And then the other thing that I found difficult was going back down. Luke's wanted to do this challenge for a while. Um, and he, you know, he went up up the crag. Um, he never complained. He never mourned. He just, you know, one foot in front of the other and, and just got up to the top. So, yeah, it's an immense achievement. And I'm immensely proud of what, what he's done. What an amazing achievement, Luke. We're all so proud of you. Luke and his dad were talking there to BBC Radio York earlier. Now, if you are planning your own challenge for children in need, we want to hear from you. Here's Tom Ingle and Pudsey with all of the details. Kill Pudsey. You know who is on the way. Each year, your fundraising helps BBC Children in Need change young lives for the better. We'll be sharing some stories on Look North and if you want to join in the fun this year, the Spotacular is on November the 17th. Let us know if you're up to anything by emailing look.north at bbc.co.uk. And who knows, Putsy might put you in the picture. I've been doing my own little challenge for children in need. We'll tell you about that later on in the week. And now to Bradford, where one of the most renowned brass bands in the world was formed over 150 years ago. That, well, there they are, they're on both sides. Uh, the Black Dyke Band has done over 350 recordings and last month placed first in the National Brass Band Championships. It's their 24th national title, which they say makes them the most successful brass band in history. Now, we can cross live to their Monday night rehearsal where Olivia Richwald has been treated to her very own performance. Olivia, it's all yours. That was the sound of more than 150 years of history here at the Black Dyke Band. Now, the band formed here in 1855 and they still rehearse in the same spot that they've been performing and um, rehearsing for decades. And they've just been named, look at that massive trophy, they've just been named the winners of the National Brass Band Championships for the 24th time. Nick, you are the musical director of the band. What does it mean for the 24th time? Oh, it's really special. With that sort of history, you can imagine we're proud of the past but we know it's what we do in the future that's really going to count. And when you that fine, well, it gives you the bragging rights in Yorkshire as well. And you perform all around the world, don't you? We do a, around 40 concerts in this country. Uh, lucky enough to go all over the world. Next year, we're already planning to go on a Japan tour and as diverse as playing at the BBC Proms to Glastonbury. Thank you very much. Well, if you come over here, you can speak to Keith, who's been in the band for more than 20 years. Now, you travel a very long way, don't you, for I these do, rehearsals? Yes, Tell yes. me about it. Uh, it's a long way. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's about 250 miles round trip, um, but it's it's worth every mile. It really is. Sometimes, I, if you get stuck in traffic, you think, "Why am I doing this?" But when I get here, I then I remember why I'm doing it. And I gather that uh, most of you are teachers. You're not actually. Uh, this isn't your professional uh, full time job, but you're um, you all do it because you love it so much. Is that right? That's right. We're all over the moon to play in this band. I can tell you. Yeah, most of us are teachers, and uh, I am as well. So I'm self employed, which makes it easy to, to do the travelling because I can sort of uh, adapt my time at school to, to fit in with the band, really. Well, so thank, that's you good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if you were enjoying uh, the music, which we then cut short, don't worry, you're coming back here and they're going to play us out at the end of the programme. But for now, back to you in the studio. I would love to see them at Glastonbury. I wonder if they wear the full festival gear. Yes, we will be hearing from them later, as Olivia said. Now, lots of you were lucky enough to see the Northern Lights last night. I missed it again. Apparently, the natural light displays happen when the sun releases large clouds of gas, and the bigger the clouds, the more visible the lights. Something like that. You've been sending us your fabulous photographs. Take a look at those. Paul, do I sound like I know what I'm talking about? I think you need to go back to school on that one. Um, I've actually, <laughs> you tell us then, Well, please. I can't, we haven't got time, but I've got a good explainer on X, which used to be Twitter. Oh, yeah, there we go. And it actually explains how we see more northern lights 
or is there something else going on? And I think you might be interested to find out. And I do apologise to those that are not on social media, uh, but perhaps if now's a good time to join. Now, now's a good time to uh, join. So we did have loads of pictures actually, but I've picked out non-Northern Lights pictures for the weather sequence because that just about sums up where we've been today. That's a fantastic rainbow in uh, Honley. More of the same in Honley and the Huddersfield area tomorrow. And I just thought that was absolutely stunning. That was. Uh, Weeta Woods in uh, Sheffield, John sent that in, the, the leaves are looking absolutely beautiful there. So if you've got any pictures, you can send them to me or that Northern Lights interesting piece I've done on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, that's at Hudson Weather Instagram and on the Weather Watcher website. So it's still unsettled over the next few days, but not quite as poor as it has been through October uh, because it's changeable. We're going to see more blue sky in between any showers or rain, whereas, of course, in October it was dull and the rain never seemed to stop. So sunny spells and scattered showers tomorrow. This is the next weather system bringing some fairly heavy rain on Wednesday morning, clearing Wednesday afternoon, and then it's back to sunshine and scattered showers. But with a westerly, most of the showers are usually in the west, eastern areas faring best of all. I think over the weekend it's more of the same, quite chilly with a touch of frost, but at least it will be bright during the day. Now there's a look at where the showers were. They were clumping together across the Pennines. Some spots have been really quite wet today. Those showers have had enough energy to get all the way through to the uh, east coast. For some reason, my graphics have just completely bounced to the further outlook. So I'll briefly tell you what's happening tonight. It's clear spells and scattered showers. For tomorrow, it looks set to be a day of sunshine and uh, scattered showers. Most of the showers in the west and the best of the sunshine will always be further east, as is summed up very nicely by that um, weather symbol. So I don't quite know what's happening here. Somebody's uh, been messing about with my graphics, I think. So we're back onto the sequence, which shows frequent showers in the west tonight, clear spells further east, and we'll see temperatures coming in at around about 6 or 7 degrees. And for the high water times, 12.14 in Scarborough. For tomorrow, as I've just said, it's sunshine and showers. Most of the showers in the west the best of the sunshine further east. If you want a better forecast, I'll be back at half past ten. Is That's that, forecast. Is that you and your faulty equipment again? I think it must be. It must <laughs> we be. won't go we there. We won't go there. <laughs> that is it from us at 6.30. Tom's back with your late bulletin. We'll leave you with the wonderful sounds of the Black Dyke Band. Good night. Seek revenge, Abby. You really expect me to answer that? <laughs> Time. Press red for all episodes on BBC iPlayer. Join us for an evening of inspiring stories, bold innovation, and incredible performances, all coming together to celebrate the Earthshot Prize. The solutions needed to repair and restore our planet are within reach. The Earthshot Prize, Sunday at 5.20 on BBC One and iPlayer. I am ready to come back bigger than ever. I'm getting my tattoo today. Have you ever heard of the Karma Sutra? But you, Alba, I wouldn't want anything more. You don't know what's coming. Let's do this. The new series of Charlotte in Sunderland starts Wednesday at 9 on BBC Three and iPlayer. Maria live with you as we escape the damp squib of a day and settle into Monday night on BBC One. EastEnders in half an hour after a brand new week begins on the One Show sofa.
Hello there and welcome to The One Show, live on BBC One and I play with Jermaine Genius. And Alex Jones. Uh, tonight we'll be joined by a Tony and Emmy winning actor who you'll know from the hit series Homeland. And films such as The Princess Bride. The brilliant Mandy Patinkin tells us why he's returning to London's West End stage after 14 years. Uh, also coming up on tonight's show. Now then, she served up culinary delights to everyone from Cameron Diaz to Dame Judi Dench. Superstar chef Mary McCartney will be telling us how cooking for Hollywood doesn't always nope. go to plan. It does not. Uh, and he's met the Mexican Mafia and visited the world's most feared prisons. But no matter where in the world he goes, Ross Kemp can't escape the demand for a selfie with Grant Mitchell. We'll hear all about his epic adventures a little later. And this weekend is, of course, Remembrance Day. And tonight we hear the moving stories of how millions of South Asian soldiers fought alongside the British during World Wars I and II. Yes, and later we'll see the heartwarming moments when the families of those soldiers discover how they'll be honoured. But first tonight, at the recent global summit on AI, tech titan Elon Musk said artificial intelligence poses one of the biggest threats to humanity. Mm. And while some people are sceptical about this technology, others see it as a force for good. Only last week we heard how effective it was in assessing some cancers. But how would you feel if the books you read were written with a helping hand from AI? Well, here's Lindsay Russell with more. I wrote a book in minutes and published it within hours. We use AI to generate a kid's storybook. Here's how to write an entire book using nothing but ChatGPT. They say that everyone has a book in them. And thanks to artificial intelligence, that's quickly becoming a reality. Harnessing the power of AI, you can channel your inner Charles Dickens and write your own novel in minutes. Author RJ Chowdhury has been using it to help with ideas for his latest detective thriller. If I get stuck on something, this really allows me at any time to say, hey, give me an idea for this. It doesn't write it for me, it's my own words, it's my own characters, but it's a fantastic thing to bounce ideas off. So can you show me? Sure. So let's say um, in my current book that I'm writing, there's a scene where my detective and his sidekick are kind of stuck in a shed. And I want to figure out ways they might get out. With only a spade, a bag of fertilizer, and let's say wet fireworks. Oh my gosh, this technology has come up with one, two, three, four, 